Hey everyone, it's Jacqueline Melanick. Welcome to Chain Reaction, a show that unpacks and dives deep into the latest trends, drama, and news with some of the biggest names in crypto, breaking things down block by block for the crypto curious. Hey everyone, it's Jacqueline Melanick. Today we have a bonus episode that I recorded a little over a week ago while moderating a chat at Georgetown University School of Business. It was with the U.S. SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce alongside Eddie Cullen, who's a graduate of Georgetown and co-founder and CEO of Crescite Innovation Corporation. We discussed a number of timely topics, including the spot Bitcoin ETF, policymaking to keep crypto innovation alive in the U.S., and the possibility of a new token safe harbor proposal by the commissioner. As always, we're getting right into it, and I hope you enjoy. And thank you for that really kind introduction. Obviously, earlier this month, the SEC approved 11 issuers for the Spot Bitcoin ETF, as I'm sure everyone in this room is aware. And I think I would like to start with noting some of the words you used in your letter, Commissioner Purse. You wrote in the letter, it was a quote saga and the denials were perplexing as the goalposts kept moving. What do you think were the real reasons the approval was pushed back? And do you think if the DC Court Circuit Court of Appeals didn't rule in favor of Grayscale in the case against the SEC, that maybe this wouldn't have happened as soon as it did? Well, thanks for that question, Jackie. And thank you for that kind introduction. I do have to give my own little introduction, which is that my views are my own views as a commissioner <laughs> and not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. And that is certainly relevant in answering your question. I don't think that we would have had these approvals had there not been the grayscale decision. Part of the problem was that over a a number of years, we had kind of gotten ourselves into a bit of a bind because we had used a different approach to looking at these kinds of applications than we had used for other applications in the past. And so it was actually unclear to me how we were going to back out of that to get to an approval at any point. And so that's why having the court come in from outside and say, the way you've been looking at this has not been right, was the out that we needed to then move forward. And so I do think that's what caused it to happen when it did. Do you think like other biases and factors, political pressure, et cetera, contributed to that as well? And if so, what are those biases internally? Well, I think, so regulators are a conservative lot of people and not politically conservative necessarily, but they're conservative when it comes to technology and new things and new products, new services. And so, you know, this was crypto, Bitcoin was, is, it's not that new anymore, but still it was relatively new when someone first came in and said, hey, we want to build an exchange traded product around this. And I think there was real concern. There, there were a lot of different conspiracy theories out there about this and, and, you know, just a lot of questions. I mean, this was something new. And so I think with gold or silver or platinum, it's a hard commodity, right? With uh, some of the other things on which Bitcoin are built or exchange traded products are built, they're, they're things that we're familiar with. This was something new. But I think there's also just a deep skepticism about anything crypto related at certainly at the SEC. And I think that was reflected in these, well, denials and then even in the approval, because you saw in the in the approval, it was not a unanimous decision. And even Chair Gensler, who did vote in favor of it, expressed some, you know, some skepticism, to say the least. What were the conversations like when you were deciding on that vote? Well, I I think I can't speak to what internal conversations are like, but I I do think looking at the statements that came out of this Mm -hmm. really gives you a picture of where different people are coming from. And I think that's helpful. It gives you a little transparency into what people are thinking. Commissioner Crenshaw laid out her thoughts on the exchange traded product in detail. And and I think that's really helpful for people to get a sense of where her concerns are. And I don't think she's alone in having those kinds of concerns in the government. So I think that was valuable. And I think it's also was helpful to get a, a window into what Chair Gensler was thinking and how he was approaching it. But as I say, this has been going on for a long time. I've been at the SEC since 2018. And that was when I first wrote a statement about a denial that we were issuing on a Bitcoin exchange traded product. And I said, I think it's, I don't think we have a reason to do it. And so once you've gotten into that 
groove, it really is very hard to get out. And I think that was evident also through the process. So I, you know, it's, it's not all about what people think about the underlying that isn't really supposed to be an issue. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, can be technically and legally a difficult thing to get from a disapproval to an approval. I mean, we're all human, so of course our opinions fall into these things, but you're like, it's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's certainly true. And and I mean, look, I have a, a view of the world that I'm pretty upfront about, which is that I don't think the government should jump in and tell people what they can and cannot buy. But I can't I can't deny the fact that there's a lot of stuff that's gone on in and around crypto that is really atrocious and People have taken advantage of other people and people have jumped in to try to make a quick buck. And, you know, none of us wants to see people getting hurt. And mm -hmm. so I do appreciate where some of my colleagues' concerns are coming from. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you speak about at the end of your your statement, I don't know the exact quote about the freedom to innovate or the freedom to express. Can you talk about a little bit about that? Like why is it important for Americans to innovate and have that freedom to do that as well, but in a responsible way, of course? Yeah. I mean, I think the U.S. has always been a place where, and this is something I love about this country, right? It's people who come from all over the world and they're bound together, not by bloodlines, but by a, a passion for ideas, right? And those ideas are freedom and the dignity of the human person and the dignity of each human, right? And so part of that dignity is the ability to use your skills and talents for things, to put yourself to work in a way that you think is going to be valuable. And when government regulation comes in and says, no, we don't think you should use your skills or your money in this particular way, we want you to use it in another way, we're overriding an individual's decision about what's best for her life. And we better have a really good reason for doing that. People don't all think the same things are valuable. And so we need to allow people to express what they think is valuable and other people can come to different conclusions. So that does drive a lot of the way I think about, it sounds sort of silly, but it drives a lot of the way I think about securities regulation because we want to build an economy that allows people to get the most out of themselves. And that means that you have to have capital markets that allow capital to flow to people who have good ideas. And those good ideas are ferreted out, not by a regulator up at the top, but by people who are on the ground, who know the people, who know the technology that they're building, who can ask those questions. It's a grassroots kind of thing. So a properly functioning capital market makes sure that capital flows in the right direction. You also have said in the past that the question of when are we going to get a spot Bitcoin ETF was one of your most asked questions. So I'm sure you're probably glad you're not getting yeah. that one anymore. Yeah. But I'm sure there are other new questions on the digital asset front. What are people asking you for now? I know there's conversations about like ETH spot ETF. I don't know if you could talk about that or whether or not a potential for that is going to happen. Well, that is, that is, yeah, that's, I, you know, <laughs> so yeah, I'm happy that the Bitcoin question doesn't come anymore, but now the ETH question. The ETH, and then the next <laughs> cryptocurrency right. and the next, yeah. <laughs> so what I will say is we have some of those before us and, and they will be considered on their facts and circumstances. I can't speak to any particular application Mm -hmm. but it's just a facts and circumstances question. But based on your own personal opinions and kind of what you said about the free market and everyone's allowed to invest in whatever they like, do you think there is a potential for it then? Because it kind of goes back to that point. Well, again, uh, while certainly I'm giving you my perspective of how I come to the job, right? That when I have a choice to maximize liberty, I will, but there are also regulatory, well, we have statutory mandates that tell us what we're supposed to do. And we have statutory parameters within which I have to operate because Congress is directly re responsible to the people. Um, so we're going to view it through the lens of what the criteria are for looking at products like that. And then on that front, I've written an article about this in the past, are cryptocurrencies, securities, commodities, or some own sector category, whatever you want to call it. And basically, it talked about how the SEC views most cryptocurrencies, aside from Bitcoin, as securities. Correct me if I'm wrong. Or there's no well, comment. Well, so I'm, no... I, I'm, I'm giving you no comment for a couple of reasons. One is... <laughs> I'll take that. We'll update the story. One, one is, I don't, you know, I don't speak for the whole SEC. And I think on this issue, it's really important that, that I make that comment because... Mm -hmm. So I'm a, I'm a lawyer by training. And so I have to answer your question to say it depends. It's yes. a facts and circumstances thing. And it really is because you can imagine, and I do imagine a world in which securities, equity securities, so stocks will be tokenized. Well, obviously just the fact that you tokenized it 
doesn't change it from being a security to a non-security. It's a security because of what it is. Mm -hmm. But you can also imagine other things that you could tokenize that would not be a security. And so I think you really have to look at the facts and circumstances. And we have to, as a regulator, be a little more legally precise than I think we've been in the past. You can have something like you can take, and this is an actual story, right? You can take a chinchilla and you can package it together with a contract that you're going to take care of these chinchillas and the profit will go to the buyer and the buyer won't have to do anything. That becomes an investment contract. It becomes a security because of the promises that came with it, not because chinchillas are securities. And so again, you you can have something that's not a security, but that's sold as a security. Mm-hmm. And that's why answering those kinds of questions about, well, are all crypto assets a security or, you know, mm-hmm. that it's very hard because you've got to get into the nuances. And, and I think, I, think uh, I was going to say, just to play off that question, I think one of the innovations or at least your perspectives on the token safe harbor proposal. And I think years ago, do you see any room potentially for a 3.0 or do you see any sort of room for that now that the spot's been approved and saying, okay, maybe there's some innovation opportunities. Um, and could you talk about that? Yeah. So a few years ago, I put out a, a token safe harbor. And the idea was to answer the question that a lot of people had, which or the problem that a lot of people had pointed out, which is that there were a lot of people issuing tokens and there was not a lot of disclosure around them. And obviously, if people are buying these things, you want to make sure they know what they're buying. And so was there a way that we could design a framework that would get the kinds of information that people buying these things would uniquely want? And there there's some things that would be the same as if you're buying anything, any security, right? You want to know who's behind it and those kinds of things. But there are certain things that are unique to this area, the economics of the blockchain. Are the founders going to hold back a number of these coins and then dump them on the market later. There are these kinds of things you want to know. You want to have a sense of what the development plan is for the project. And so I was trying to get at the safe harbor that I put out would require people to make these disclosures for the initial period when they when they were selling these tokens. And then the idea was that if you really decentralize the blockchain such that no one had more information than anyone else, the disclosures wouldn't be necessary anymore because all that information would be out there and it would be available for anyone to see. There are a lot of complicated legal questions around this. And I think we've seen this highlighted in the fact that Congress has spent a lot of time thinking about what a good regulatory framework would look like, who the regulators should be. So I think we would definitely need a 3.0 if we were going to do something like this. But I think we'd also want to understand where legislation is going in this area. But I certainly do think that there's room for something to address the legitimate concerns that people who are crypto skeptics have, while at the same time addressing the legitimate concerns of innovators who say, look, I'm willing to provide information. I'm willing to do all kinds of things. You just have to give me a path that's viable for a project of my size. Don't pretend that a token project that is brand new, just getting off the ground, is going to make the same kinds of disclosures that a company that's been around for 15 years and is doing an IPO is going to do. There's just a real mismatch between the expectations that some people would like to put on these token projects and the reality. And the result is that we end up in the worst of both worlds. We don't get any disclosure and we get companies moving outside of the US and people spend a lot of time spinning their wheels thinking about regulation, which as we were talking about before, they could spend thinking about what, you know, real things that could be done with the technology. Right. And as a follow-up, just as a follow-up in terms of education, right? I think we talked about this a little bit before, Professor Ryan, we've talked about this. In education on what blockchain is, right? Or what? how does the technology work? You know, I, we, we deal with a lot with Hakeem University. You know, they're in Africa. You know, we deal with five or six African priests who are absolutely wonderful, but we have to teach them about blockchain and how it works. And, and there is an altruistic innovation or innovative curiosity there. So how do you, how do you feel consumer education or just education plays into that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I know it's important because when I came into the job, I knew a little bit about Bitcoin, but I felt like there was a lot I had to learn just about blockchain in general and about how some of the other types of blockchains worked. And and so I spent a lot of time and still do spend a lot of time trying to understand this. And I feel like there's so much more that I need to understand. And so both having regulators get to a better understanding, but also having people who are interested in maybe investing in this, have a better understanding, I think is important. And enabling, empowering people to sort of cut through the 
stuff that's nonsense mm-hmm. and find the stuff that's real because there's so much nonsense in this area, you know, and there's this, this idea say. that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's this idea that, you know, blockchain will solve every problem or crypto will solve every problem. And we really need to get to a place where people can sort through, okay, here's some, a place where it's useful. Here's a place where it won't do anything at all. And I think education is core to figuring that out. Do you have any details for like a 3.0 yet, or that's not? Your- I don't have any details details for a 3.0, but I'm certainly open to people tossing ideas my way. So that is how 1.0 and 2.0 came about. I put the safe harbor up on GitHub and actually got Mm -hmm. some good feedback from people on that. So I welcome ideas of not only on the token safe harbor, but more generally, if the SEC were to wake up tomorrow and say, we want to take a more productive approach, what would ideas look like? Where would we need to spend our time? And so, you know, I think you asked that question, Eddie, sort of suggesting, well, now that we've done the Bitcoin exchange traded product, is there a new day dawning at the SEC with respect to crypto? (laughs) I think that's a very optimistic uh, take, (laughs) but someday there will be a new day dawning and we need to be ready to go when that day happens. Because again, a lot of people are spinning their wheels, wasting a lot of time on thinking about regulation. Let's get to a point where we actually meet the legitimate regulatory objectives in a way that allows people to spend more time thinking about productive things. I think going back to one of the points you were talking about earlier, where it's like a company that is unicorn size, they have their own counsel, legal team, et cetera, versus a startup that just raised a couple million dollars, if that, and they have a team of like three to five people. One versus the other is going to be able to go to court the way Grayscale did or be able to defend themselves. And the other, like you said, might go offshore. So what the proposal, if there ever was a new one, address that to make it kind of even for both sides? Yeah, I think that would be the goal is you, and we do this with our securities regulations already. We have different types of ways of raising capital depending where you are in your life cycle. And I think we're constantly trying to think through whether that's working. So you saw crowdfunding is a relatively, relatively, it's still not that new, but a relatively new mechanism. I've been thinking about a micro offering exemption, which again, this is not crypto specific, but would allow small companies to raise small amounts of money. So right-sizing regulation is something that we have the authority from Congress to do, and we ought to be doing in this space as as well, in other areas as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the crypto space has been impacted since you've been in the SEC world because of what's been going on over the past few years? Like in terms of talent leaving and absolutely, like that. yeah. Well, I think that the message has been sent that it's really complicated to do business in the U.S., and mm-hmm. so a lot of people are looking elsewhere or looking just to do something different. And I think that's problematic. And it's also problematic <laughs> from our perspective as a regulator, because if you don't have clear rules, it really does make it harder for the regulator too to sort through and see who's doing something bad and who's just mm-hmm. trying to do things but can't figure out how to do it by the book. I'm sure you love the uh, offshore accounts, all the people working outside of the books. Yeah. Well, and the thing is that <laughs> I think what one thing that makes me really sad about it is that stuff happens offshore and they try to isolate and keep the U.S. out, but really it flows back into the U.S. and people get hurt in the U.S. And then they come to us and they say, well, where were you? Mm -hmm. And my response is, well, you know, despite what some people think, we don't actually regulate the rest of the world, that we don't have authority to do that. But it is ultimately a symptom of the lack of regulatory clarity here. And so I think people do end up getting hurt as a result of that. And that's something that we could change. So I hope we do. Now, are there are there ways in advice? And I think of technology in the space, right? You know, I think of an organization like MC5, who has decentralized identities for, you know, dot Fordham. So like you can have identities or new mechanisms for KYC and, and identifying. And you talk about, I guess, your perspectives on the innovation of anonymous kind of smart contract addresses or decentralized identity. Do you think there's room for innovation there? You know, do you think there's room to improve? And, and what are some maybe suggestions of things that could be possible? Well, I certainly don't, don't want to put myself in the spot of someone who knows the technology well. But what I can say is that a lot of people I talk to now are working on decentralized identity kind of issues. And so I think that is a really interesting avenue. And I I think it could be useful for 
regulators too. Actually, a lot of people could benefit from decentralized identity if it actually works. So I'm curious to see what happens there. And I think that point is an important one because it, a lot of the focus on the technology has been financial, but there are a lot of non-financial uses of the technology and certainly something like privacy or identity. Those things will have intersections with the financial regulatory world, but it's not fundamentally a financial innovation. And so I hope the uncertainty that we've created doesn't stifle that kind of innovation. I think it has potential to be really important. And that said, well, let me give you an example of where I think it could be useful. We have something called accredited investors in the US. And it's not something I'm a fan of because it basically says if you want to invest in certain investments, you have to be wealthy already, or you've got to be earning a high income already. I don't think that's a very American thing, but we have it. We're stuck with it, right? It's not changed yet. But one thing you have to do to prove that you're accredited is people hand over their tax returns to uh -huh. people. Mm -hmm. And that's not always a comfortable thing to do. So if you had some sort of token that you could prove you're mm -hmm. accredited without having to show people all your information, mm -hmm. that could be very protective of the investors. And so there are things like that where I think these things could come in handy. One concern that I have about this kind of technology is that it does make it easier for the government to sort of engage in surveillance activities. And that's an area where I think we have to be very careful and put in proper protections so that the technology, because it works so well, doesn't enable the government to do more than we're comfortable as a people having our governments do. It's an interesting concept, right? Almost like a dot accredited, like understanding, but also making sure the tech can be maybe off chain and not online. So there's mechanisms for protection. Yeah. It's fascinating. Now we're moving on to audience questions and to protect their identities, I'll be reading off what each person asked. To kick it off, one audience member who was an attorney that worked with crypto companies asked, are you concerned that we're driving a lot of innovative companies from crypto offshore and by the time legislation catches up or the SEC and other agencies catch up, is it going to be too late? I am concerned about that. The U.S. has a real advantage, right? Because we are a place where, as I said before, people come from all over the world and they want to do stuff here. There's a community of people here. There's a commitment to innovation and liberty that draws people in. And so I think we get a little bit lazy because we have that advantage. And we think, well, people will come to the U.S. because it's the U.S. and it has these things that are so special. And I do think that's true. But I think if you get people embedded somewhere else and in the regulatory framework that exists somewhere else, it will be harder to encourage them to come back when we get our act together. So I think the the faster we move, the better it is. Now that said, there's also advantage to us to watch to see how other jurisdictions' regulatory frameworks work out and where maybe they didn't get things right, and then we can build a better version. So that's the positive angle is that we can benefit from others' work. But yeah, I mean, it's never good to run people out of the U.S. I think a lot of my regulatory colleagues would say they're totally fine with running crypto out of the U.S. because they think it's useless. And again, that is, it's a merit regulatory view of things. They might be right that a lot of this stuff is going to go nowhere. They, I'm sure they are right about that. But we want to make sure that the core of what is useful ends up being here. The next question was a follow-up to the first one from another person asking, are we at a point now where the U.S. has had the benefit of looking at what other countries have tried to do for many years with varied success? And because the U.S. usually is a regulatory leader, is this the natural time to take the lead? I mean, it's natural, except that we're in an election year. So, so that means that that I think um, Congress and Congress has put a lot of time into this and bipartisan, right? There's a lot of interest. And so I think that we will see continued interest from Congress, but it's just, it's a little bit difficult. And then on the other side, I'll say too, that while Europe has Mika and they're, they're implementing it, we are just watching that implementation happen. So I think we'll still have a lot to learn over time as we watch them. I would like us to do something now, but I think even if we, I don't know, as soon as, as soon as that new day can dawn, I guess is my hope that we'll build something and we'll build something that will not be so inflexible that it won't accommodate change, right? Because we can't know what crypto is going to be 20 years from now. We can't know that today. So we have to build something that's flexible enough. 
Now switching gears a little bit, a separate audience member asked a question about regulating in a post-FTX crash world. And if regulators are now trying to fit crypto into a traditional finance or TradFi system, they asked Commissioner Peirce how she would form that paradigm and if there's still a chance to have both adjacent systems. It's an interesting way of asking the question and of thinking about what happened. So first, I can't talk about FTX specifically. You know, I think the events certainly had got everyone thinking about what are, what are we trying to achieve here? And I think that some people will say, well, you want to regulate like activities alike. And other people will say, well, wait a minute, we want to not regulate the technology in a way that ignores the things that the technology has to offer. And so I think that that conversation is still kind of playing out because when I think about the technology and something like we have transfer agents, right? And really, if you're using a blockchain, that sort of challenges the notion of having a transfer agent. And so at what point do we become comfortable that we can let the transfer agent go and that we can rely on the blockchain. I think that's just going to take time. But I think if we end up just trying to say, well, no, you have to do everything exactly the same way that you would do it in the traditional world, then I I think we kind of lose the value. So I feel like we're going to have to work our way to a point where we say, all right, what are the unique challenges of this technology that require special regulatory attention? And what are the unique opportunities that require us to make some exceptions and allow people to do things in a different way? And that's going to probably be a very slow and painful process. And this next question, I would just play for you all if we could, but the audience member made some very salient points about what an asset is in the U.S. to be able to see the regulatory leadership publicly disagree and debate these issues. They went on to ask if the SEC is looking to any regulatory frameworks from the global community for examples and inspiration on what the U.S. could do. Well, I think there are a lot of regulators that are thinking about this with a much more open mind. And that's really, for me, that's the most important thing. You know, can we work with people who are innovating to figure out, again, how to achieve our regulatory objectives while also allowing them to move forward? And I think that's what some other places have done better. Singapore is one and Switzerland. And, you know, again, I think Mika, the UK has done this. And this is not to say we want to have a regulator that just says anything goes, you can do anything here that you want. It really needs to be a regulator that is willing to be tough as a supervisor. If you're going to be a registered entity, you're going to get the same scrutiny that others get, but at the same time allows some (coughs) testing of what works and what doesn't. So some sort of sandbox like thing, not where the regulator is sitting right in the sandbox, but allowing some experimentation to happen and recognizing the need for regulatory approval not to take 20 years or 10 years or five years or even two years, right? It has to be because the money does run out at some point. And so I think some other jurisdictions just have done better, a better job at that. You know, again, I don't wholly endorse any other regulatory regime, but I think Bermuda has done some interesting things too. They're different places that have really Wyoming here in the US. So we have a lot, a lot that we can draw on from a lot of different jurisdictions, I think. That same audience member followed up with the question of, you mentioned Wyoming, are you finding as we did, more and more states are stepping into the fray like pre-1940 and starting to make this up? Yeah, I think states are are interested in encouraging people to settle there, right, to build their companies there. And so they're looking at ways. But because of the way the financial regulatory system is set up, and again, as I said, this isn't all about financial regulation, but because of the way the financial regulatory system is set up, the federal overlay is there. And so we have to address this at a federal level, I think, even in order to make it workable for states to move forward in a lot of the things they want to do. And just because of the nature of our country, we're not state by state, right? It's all so integrated. So we can learn a lot, I think. And it's great that states are doing some innovation. We can think about what they're doing. That's helpful, but it's still incumbent upon us to do something. I guess uh, real quick, we'll come one second to your question is um, now you start about the global level, state level, how can educational institutions like Georgetown, you know, work with regulatory bodies in terms of helping, you know, whether it's research or others or any thoughts there on how there can be kind of a a collaboration? Because I I personally feel 
at, at schools and universities, you know, I would I would think they're a little bit more of a safe space to, mm-hmm. to innovate and, and practice and do. You know, what, what roles like Georgetown can they play in in helping regulators? Well, I mean, I think one thing is helping regulators think through what a sensible regulatory framework would look like. There's a professor at Georgetown Law School, Chris Brummer, who's done some really interesting thinking. And helping, I think, to focus regulators on, you know, don't just write this off because actually this could end up being a technology that is really powerful in getting to investors the information that they need, you know, maybe in a form that is more useful to them, right? So that is really an area where imagining what a regulatory framework would look like. And then also just the education component of helping us understand how the technology works, where the areas we might, might want to be careful about, where those lie, where the potential um, problems would arise. That's great. Yeah, no, I think of a world of a future where we have masters of decentralized finance or yeah. bachelors, right? Yeah. You know. Not now, but in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the regulators allow it to happen, I mean, that's the thing too. Decentralized finance, I think, is a little bit at a precipice, or maybe that's not right. I don't know what the right term is, but where, you know, it could go either way because a lot of regulators. What's the word? Crossword? Crossroads. That's the word. That's the word. Yeah. So because because regulators are so scared about decentralization because it means that they don't have control over those entities. But at the same time, that's where the power comes of building a resilient financial system that you don't have to bail out these large institutions because decentralization builds resilience. And so I hope that we'll be in a world where we do have masters of decentralized finance because it's it will be around, not extinct. And then you could teach a course at it. (laughs) (laughs) The next question was a long one, but basically it's centered around custody, consumer comfort, and the tokenization of securities. Well, so custody is is an area where, you know, if we're thinking about places people could do some thinking and help us regulators do some thinking, I think custody is one of them. There are unique challenges with custody and digital assets that I think still need some deep thinking. We did put out, so you referred to the custody rule. We have a custody rule for investment advisors that has been around for a while, and we put out a proposal to update that custody rule. It was not just about digital assets. It was about all assets, and we've gotten lots of very fiery comments, (laughs) some related to digital assets, some related to none, you know, to, to more traditional assets, and people told us that we got it wrong. It's such an important bedrock rule that I, we really, I think, need to be very careful before we go to a final rule. I would like us to at least think about the idea of putting that out again for more comment, doing a reproposal. With respect to digital assets specifically, I mean, I think we haven't provided the kind of guidance that we need to provide there. And and I think that's something, again, if I'm giving people a homework assignment, give me ideas on what a good framework would look like. And the final audience question was a follow-up on ETFs. They asked, can you talk a little bit about the in-kind and cash crate redemption issues, maybe for a policy and technical perspective? Well, I don't know that I can talk about it from a technical perspective, but I think that you raise a point that's worth highlighting, which is that these exchange-traded products are different from others and that they're cash-based instead of allowing in-kind. And so I guess my policy concern there is that, is this going to have an effect on how these operate? And is that effect going to be negative? I don't know how that's going to play out, but the SEC just has a very complicated relationship too with allowing our regulated entities to have a touch on Bitcoin to have it. So that plays into this as well. But I don't have an answer. I'm curious to see how this will play out. Do you have any thoughts on what I should be looking for? (laughs) (laughs) That wraps up the chat with the SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce. I hope that the Q&A part was as enjoyable as the first half. And as always, thanks for listening in and we'll catch you next time. Bye. We'll be back every week with the top news on the crypto ecosystem. Catch us on Tuesdays for interviews with experts in the Web3 space. You can keep up with us on Spotify, Apple Music, or your favorite pod platform, and subscribe to our companion newsletter, also called Chain Reaction. Links to the newsletter and the stories we talked about can be found in our show notes. And be sure to follow us at Chain underscore Reaction on Twitter. Chain Reaction is hosted by myself, Anita Ramaswamy, along with my co-hosts, Lucas Matney and Jackie Melanick. 
We are produced by Yashad Kulkarni, and our associate producer is Maggie Stamets, with editing by Kel Keller. Bryce Durbin is our illustrator, Alyssa Stringer leads audience development, and Henry Pickovet manages TechCrunch's audio products. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.